And the connections have been made. Good evening. Good evening to everybody. Hope all is well. We're diving right in. Looking forward to saying hello to those who join. And hello to those who are watching afterwards. The sky has cracked open. What a wonderful way to start. Suppose this place looks exciting. We should head there. Maybe gather some more Sirmarite along the way. How wonderful. Or did we already loot this place? I think we might have. Straight into yep, it's been rowing straight into trees is one of my specialties. So instead, we shall engage in snail combat while we wait. We're going to be doing about uh, oh, probably 14 minutes of hanging out and chatting. And then we'll dive right into story time this fine evening. Hopefully for some wondrous experiences in the world of the Brothers Grimm. those guys. Let's see. It's foggy. Pretty, uh, pretty chill night tonight. Not expecting a lot to go on, but uh, we'll have three, I think three or four stories for uh, this fine evening. Let's see if we can give this uh, cloud a greeting. Hello, cloud of whatever. Hey there. Well, wonderful. I sure showed them. arrows. And I'm in the mud. Muddy, muddy, mud. And again. Definitely on purpose. Wonderful. Not a lot of people here. I'm sure it's fine. Mm -hmm. Do do do. 
Nettle. Don't step in the nettle. Okay. You got it. Curious how the stream quality is. Not bad, not bad, okay. Thank you for your patronage. A cinder appears. Hello, cinder. Welcome on in. It's good to have you. Thank you for being here. How are you? And I wonder if you're excited for uh, some absolutely wild tales. Hear me? Is audio quality okay enough? Bazinga. Ooh, them crabs almost got me. to go around. But yes, Cinder, hello. I hope you can hear me well enough. Ooh, Dentrophist. Wonderful. Hey, buddy. It's bad enough that they're hideous. It's worse that they don't drop any loot when they die. say it's time to start heading home, don't you? Get out of here. Get out of here. Okay. Can I 
thread the needle? That is the question. Ooh, we did it. Very nice. Looking forward to whatever blunders occur here. Straight into that tree after I totally just threaded the needle. That looks like poison ivy. We are back home, right next to a piranha. Two piranhas. Let's go inside. Alright, well, we have loots for days. And we're gonna need to make another chest it appears why not We are going to get ready for story time. Let's see, where will we go? Let's go west. I left my boat out, that's unfortunate. And a westward we go. Lag. Wondrous tar pits. A good place for story time. I'd say. Looks fine. Hello, Freeman. Happy you could make it. We'll be starting in a couple of seconds, in fact. Oven food, that sounds wondrous. Well, welcome on in to story time. 
We're going to be reading from the Brothers Grimm. Amidst the rain and crickets and frogs and other creatures. Ooh, chicken nuggies and alpha bifides. You'll have to tell me about alpha bifides. But for now, we shall begin on chapter 31. Oh, alpha bites. That sounds wonderful. Uh, this story title is uh, either Jorinda and Joringel or Yorinda and Joringel. I feel like that's going to be a bit of a spiky right there, isn't it? Okay, cool. Right there, I'm looking at it. That's where the lightning is going to strike. Cool. And so we begin with Jorinda and Joringle. Oh, I lost my spot and found it. Once upon a time, there was an ancient castle in the middle of a deep forest where an old woman lived all by herself. She was a powerful witch. Every day she turned herself into a cat or an owl and every evening she turned herself back into her human form. She knew how to capture birds and other game, which she would slaughter and then roast and eat. If any man came within a hundred steps of the castle, she would cast a spell over him, making him unable to move until she freed him. If an innocent girl came that close, however, the old woman would change her into a bird and force her into a wicker basket. Then she would carry the basket up to a room in the castle where she kept more than 7,000 of other birds of this kind. Hello, Quill. Welcome on in. Glad to have you here. Thank you for being here. Now, at that time, there was a girl called Jorinda, who people said was the most beautiful girl in the whole kingdom. She was betrothed to a handsome boy called Joringo. It wasn't long before their marriage, and they loved nothing more than to be in each other's company. One afternoon, they wanted to be alone, so they went for a walk in the forest. We must be careful not to go too close to the castle, Joringle said. It was a lovely evening. The sun shone warmly on the tree trunks against the dark green of the deep woods and turtle doves cooed mournfully in the old beech trees. I love how this thunderstorm is totally taking, literally stealing my thunder with its own thunder. <laughs> From time to time, Yorinda wept, though she didn't know why. She sat down in the sunlight and sighed, and Joringle sighed too. They felt as sad as if they were close to death. In the intensity of their emotions, they lost track of where they were and couldn't find their way home. When the sun had not quite set, when it was half below and half above the mountains, Joringle, searching for the right path, parted the leaves of a bush and saw the wall of the castle only a few yards away. It was such a shock that he nearly fainted. In the same moment, he heard Jorinda beginning to sing. My little bird with red, red ring, sorrow, 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 sing. My sweet bird with the ring so red, the lovely turtle dove is. But she couldn't complete the verse. Instead, Joringle heard a nightingale pouring out its song, and he saw to his horror that there was indeed a nightingale perched on a branch just where Jorinda had been standing. Not only that, but a night owl with glowing eyes was flying around her. It flew around three times, crying, Too hoo Too hoo Too hoo And Joringle himself had been turned to stone. He couldn't move, couldn't cry out, couldn't even blink. It was almost dark by then. 
The owl flew into a bush and he lost sight of it. But then the leaves rustled and out came a bent old woman, haggard and yellow with blood-red eyes and a crooked nose whose tip almost touched her chin. Mumbling to herself, she snatched the nightingale from the branch and couldn't from the branch and carried it away. And Joringo couldn't cry out, couldn't move a muscle. The nightingale was gone. Before long, the old woman came back empty-handed. In a cracked old voice, she said, When the moon shines into the basket, Zakiel set him free. And at that moment, Joringo felt his limbs loosen, and he was able to move again. He flung himself to his knees before the old woman and cried, Oh, please give me back my Jorinda. Never, said the witch. You'll never get her back. He pleaded. He cried aloud. He wept, but nothing would change her mind. She didn't stop to listen, but left him crying. Oh, what's to become of me? He left the castle and made his way to a village where he wasn't known. There he found work as a shepherd, which kept him there for a long time. He often went back to gaze at the castle, but never went close. Hmm. One night he had a strange dream. He dreamed he had found a beautiful red flower with a pearl nestling in its petals. In the dream he plucked the flower and took it to the castle, where he could open every door and every wicker birdcage just by touching it with the flower, and he managed to free his Jorinda. When he woke up next morning he set off at once to find the flower from his dream. He searched for eight days, and on the ninth he found a flower as red as blood with a dewdrop among its petals as large as the finest pearl. He plucked the flower with the greatest care and set off for the castle, and he passed within the magic circle. And as he passed within the magic circle, he felt nothing stopping him. He was able to move without hindrance as far as the gate. Encouraged by that, Joringel touched the flower to the gate, which immediately sprang open. He went in and stood in the dismal courtyard listening for the sound of the birds. It wasn't hard to hear. He followed the sound of their singing and soon found himself in the great room where they were all kept in their seven thousand baskets. The witch was feeding them at the moment. And when Joringel came in, she stopped and turned to him, spitting and screaming with anger. Her curses were appalling, and she spat gall and venom from her wrinkled lips, but nothing touched him and she couldn't get close enough to scratch him with her claw-like nails. He took no notice, but went on freeing the birds one after another, wondering how in the world he would find his Jorinda among so many. But then he noticed that the old woman had taken one basket down and was making for the door. He leapt across the room and touched the basket with the flower, and it flew open, and he touched the witch with the flower as well, and all her powers fell away. And there was Jorinda, as beautiful as ever, and she threw her arms around his neck and hugged him tight. He released all the other birds, and then Joringel and his Jorinda went home, where they soon were married, and they lived together happily for many years. That's the end of that one. Oh, I am yawning the whole entire time. It's great. I hope it's contagious. <laughs> Not like y'all deserve it, though. You've been wonderful. So now this is chapter 32, and the title is Six Who Made Their Way in the World. And off we go. There was once a man who could turn his hand to anything. He had fought in the war and conducted himself bravely, but when the war came to an end he was sent on his way with three pennies and nothing more. Hold on, he said. What sort of pay is this? If I find the right lads to help me, I'll make the king empty his treasury. You wait and see. Furious, he marched off into the forest. He hadn't gone far before he saw a man pulling up six trees, as if they'd been stalks of corn. The soldier said to him, Will you be my servant and go with me? 
Certainly, said the man, but first I must take this bundle of twigs home to my mother. And he took one of the trees and tied it round the rest, and then slung the whole bunch up on his shoulder and carried it away. A little later he came back and went off together with his master, who said, We too will certainly make our way in the world. They had gone a little way when they saw a hunter who was down on one knee, taking aim at something they couldn't see. The soldier said, Hunter, what are you shooting at? Two miles from here, said the hunter, there's a fly sitting on the branch of an oak tree. I'm going to shoot out its left eye. Oh, come with me, said the soldier. If we three go together, we'll certainly make our way in the world. The hunter was willing, so off they went. They soon came to seven windmills whose sails were busily turning round and round, even though there wasn't a breath of wind and not a leaf was stirring on the trees. Well, would you look at that, said the soldier. I've never seen the like. What could be turning those sails? On he went with his two servants, and two miles further on they came to a man sitting in the tree, holding one nostril closed and blowing through the other. What are you doing up there? said the soldier. Two miles back along the road there are seven windmills. I'm blowing the sails round. I'm surprised you didn't see them. Oh, come with me, said the soldier. We saw them all right. With a talent like yours, we four will certainly make our way in the world. The blower agreed. They walked on, and after a while they came to a man who was standing on one leg, with his other one unhitched on the ground beside him. You look as if you've made yourself comfortable, said the soldier. Having a rest, are you? Well, you see, I'm a runner. I go fast. I can't help it. With both legs on, I go faster than a bird can fly. Oh, come with me, said the soldier. That's a rare talent. Join forces with us, and we'll certainly make our way in the world and perhaps I'll call you Sonic. The runner joined in the, with them, and presently they came to a man who was wearing his cap on one side, with the flap over one of his ears. Why are you wearing your hat like that, said the soldier? You look half-witted. Ah, there's a reason for it, said the man. If I put it straight, such a deep frost will fall, all of a sudden, that birds will drop dead out of the air. Well, we can't let a gift like that go begging, said the soldier. Join the rest of us, and we'll make our way in the world, all right? Sorry. Join the rest of us, and we'll make our way in the world, all right? So he strode along with the rest, and soon they came to a city where the king had just made a proclamation. Whoever ran a race against his daughter and won would marry her and inherit the kingdom. If he lost the race, however, he'd lose his head as well. The soldier thought this was worth risking. So he went to the king and said, I'll take on the race, your majesty, on one condition. And that is that one of my servants can run instead of me. As you wish, said the king, but on the same condition, if he loses, you both will go to the scaffold. They agreed on the terms. Each runner was to be given a jug in which to bring some water from a spring this, that was a long way off, and the first one back would win. When everything was ready, the soldier buckled on his servant's leg for him and said, Don't hang about, it's your head too, remember. The runner and the king's daughter took their jugs and set off. After less than a minute, when the king's daughter had only gone a little way, the runner was already out of sight. In no time at all, he reached the spring, filled his jug and turned around. Halfway back, though, he felt like taking a nap, so he lay down and closed his eyes, using for a pillow a horse's skull he found lying on the ground so he wouldn't feel too comfortable. He didn't want to sleep too long and lose the race. Meanwhile, the king's daughter, who was much better at running than common people, had reached the spring. She filled her jug and set off at once on the return lap, and soon she came across her opponent lying fast asleep. The enemy's been delivered into my hands, she thought, and emptied his jug before running on. And everything would have been lost if the hunter hadn't happened to be standing on the castle walls, watching it all with his sharp eyes. The king's daughter shan't beat us, he cried, and he loaded his gun, took aim, and shot the horse's skull out from under the runner's head, waking him up with a jolt. The runner sat up and blinked, and saw at once that his jug was empty and that the king's daughter had overtaken him. Not a bit worried, he raced back to the spring, filled his jug again, and sped back to the town, managing to beat the king's daughter by ten minutes. I was just beginning to stretch my legs, he said. It could hardly be called running what I was doing in the first lap. 
The king wasn't at all pleased to lose his daughter to a common soldier, and, as for the daughter, she liked it even less, so they put their heads together to think of a way of getting rid of both him and his companions. Finally, the king said, Ah, I've got it! Don't you worry, we'll make sure they'll never see their homes again. He went to the six and said, I want to make sure you fellows have a good time. Eat, drink, and be merry. He led them to a room with an iron floor, and the doors were made of iron, too, and the windows had heavy iron bars. In the middle of the room was a table spread with a splendid feast, and the king said, In you go and enjoy yourselves. As soon as they were all inside, he had the door locked and bolted. Then he sent for the cook and told him to light a fire in the room below, and build it up and keep feeding it till the iron glowed red hot. The cook did so, and before long the six companions sitting round the table began to feel warm. At first they thought that was because of the food they were eating, but when it got hotter and hotter, and they tried to leave the room, they found the door locked and the windows barred. Then they realized what the king was up to. He was intending to burn them alive. Well, let him try, said the man with the cap on sideways. I'll bring a frost that'll have this fire crawling away in shame. So he put his hat on straight, and such a frost set in that the heat faded at once, and the food on the table began to freeze. After a couple hours had gone by, the king thought they must have all burned to death, so he had the door open to see, but he found them all in their best of health. In fact, they said they'd like to come outside and warm up a bit, because it was so cold in there that the food had frozen to the plates. The king was furious and went downstairs to scold the cook. I thought I told you to make the fire hotter and hotter. And so I did, your majesty. Here it is. Look, blazing away. When the king saw the raging fire, he realized that he hadn't got the better of the six companions yet, and he'd have to try something cleverer next time. So he cudgeled his brains and finally thought he had found a way of getting rid of them. He said to the soldier, Look. You're a man of the world. Let's be straight with each other. If I give you some gold, will you give up the princess and clear off? Fair enough, said the soldier. What about letting me take as much as one of my servants can carry? Then I'll say cheerio to the princess and we'll be off. Just one servant? Just the one. Give us a couple of weeks and then we'll come to collect it. The king agreed. The soldier went off and summoned all the tailors in the kingdom and gave them the job of sewing one gigantic sack. It took them two weeks, and when it was ready, the strong man, the one who pulled up the tree, slung it over his shoulder and went with his... Sorry. And when it was ready, the strong man, the one who pulled up the trees, slung it over his shoulder and went with his master to the king. The king saw them coming and said, Who's that extraordinary fellow carrying the huge bundle of canvas over his shoulder? Good lord, it's as big as a howl! Suddenly he realized who the man was. Oh no, he thought. That's the servant who's going to carry the gold, and that's the sack he's going to carry it in. I don't believe it. The king ordered his treasurers to bring a ton of gold, thinking that surely that would be enough. It took sixteen mighty bombardiers to carry it all out, but the strong man tossed it into his bag with one hand and said, This hardly covers the bottom. Get a move on and bring some more. We want to leave today. Little by little, all the king's treasury was brought out, and the strong man tossed it all into the sack. Still not even half full, he said. You've brought nothing but crumbs so far. Keep going. So they had to send for seven thousand wagons, filled with gold from all over the kingdom, and the strong man tossed them all into the sacks, whether with the oxen that pulled them or not. Oh, sorry. Into the sack together with the oxen that pulled them reading is on par today. Well, it's not quite full, but that'll have to do, he said. No point in being greedy about it. And he swung the sack up over his shoulder and went off with his companions. The king watched all this, and when he saw all the wealth of his kingdom disappearing on the back of one man, he lost his temper. Send the cavalry after them, he ordered. I won't stand for this. Bring back the gold. The two finest regiments soon caught up with the soldier, and his servants, and their commander called out, Hands up! Put down that sack of gold and stand back or we'll cut you to ribbons! What's that he's trying to say, said the blower? Hands up, cut to ribbons? Let's see how you like dancing around in the air. He closed one nostril and blew, blew through the other, 
and in moments every horse and every rider was whirled into the air as if a hurricane was tossing them about, here, there, and everywhere. Some went high, some were scattered among the bushes, and one sergeant called out, Mercy! Mercy! He was a valiant fellow, who'd been wounded nine times in the king's service, so the blower and his companions didn't want to humiliate him, and they let him down gently. Now go back and tell the king to send as many regiments as he wants, said the blower, and I'll make them all dance in the clouds like yours. When the king got the message, he said, Oh, let the fellows go, I've had enough. So the six made their way home, divided up their fortune, and lived happily for the rest of their days. <laughs> oh, what a treat. That, uh... If you really need to blow your nose and carry a lot of treasure, then let's really go for it. <laughs> Chapter 33, and the last one we're doing for tonight, is entitled Gambling Hans. Or titled, not entitled. Once there was a man called Hans who was crazy about gambling, so much that so everyone who knew him called him Gambling Hans. He just couldn't stop playing at cards or dice, and in the end he lost all his possessions, his pots and pans and tables and chairs, his bed and all the rest of his furniture, and finally his house itself. On the evening before his creditors were going to take possession of the house, the Lord and St. Peter turned up at the door and asked him to put them up for the night. You're welcome, said Gambling Hans, but you'll have to sleep on the floor. I haven't got a bed left. The Lord said they didn't mind that, and they'd provide their own food. What's more? St. Peter gave Hans three groschen and asked him to go to the baker's and buy a loaf of bread. He set off willingly, but on the way he had to pass the house where he used to gamble with the bunch of scoundrels who'd won most of his possessions. And when they saw him passing, they called out, Hey, Hans, we're playing. Want to come and join in? I can't, he said. I've got nothing left, and these three groschen aren't mine. Doesn't matter they're as good as anyone else's. Come on. Of course he couldn't resist. All the time the Lord and St. Peter had been waiting, and he <coughs> when Hans didn't come back they went to look for him. The money was gone by that time, and when he saw them coming he pretended to be looking for the coins in a puddle, and stood there bending over and poking at the water with a stick. It was no good, though. The Lord knew he'd lost it at the gambling table. St. Peter gave him another three groschen, and since he knew they were watching, he didn't gamble it in this time but bought the bread as they told him. Then they went back to his house and sat on the floor to eat their dry bread supper. Hans, do you happen to have any wine in the house? said the Lord. No, Lord, I'm sorry to say. That was one of the first things I gambled away. The barrels in my cellar are bone dry. Well, go and have a look, said the Lord. I think you'll find some wine down there. No, honest, many a time I've tipped those barrels on end, and believe me, there isn't a drop. I think it would be worth looking, said the Lord. Out of politeness, Hans went down and did as the Lord said. And he was flabbergasted to find that not only was there some wine left, it was wine of the highest quality. He looked around for something to carry it up in, flushed the cobwebs out of an old enamel jug, and filled it to the top. The three of them sat there passing the jug around and talking till they felt sleepy, and then they went to bed on the bare floorboards. In the morning the Lord said, Now, Hans, I'd like to give you three gifts as a reward for your hospitality. What would you like? The Lord had been thinking that Hans would ask for a gar guaranteed place in heaven, but he soon found out he was wrong about that. Well, that's very handsome of you, Lord. I'd like a pack of cards that'll always win. I'd like a pair of dice that'll always win. And I'd like a... a, 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 a let me see. I'd like a tree that grows all kinds of fruit. Right, and one other thing about this tree, if anybody climbs it, they can't get down till I give them permission. Oh, very well, said the Lord, and produced the cards and the dice with a flick of his fingers. And the tree, said Hans, it's outside in a pot. So the Lord and St. Peter went on their way. After that, Hans began to gamble as he'd never gambled before. He won every bet he made, and before long he owned half the world. St. Peter was keeping an eye on him, and he said to the Lord, Lord, we can't have this. Any day now he'll own the whole world. We've got to send death to fetch him. So they did. 
When Death turned up, Hans was at the gaming table as usual. Hans, said Death, it's time to stop gambling. In fact, time's up for you altogether. Come along. Hans just happened to have a royal flush in his hand, and when he felt bony fingers grasping his shoulder and looked up and saw Death, he said, Oh, it's you. I'll be along in a minute. Do us a favor, would you? There's a tree outside with some nice fruit on it. Climb up and pick a bit of that, and we can eat it on the way. So Death climbed the tree, and of course he couldn't get down. Hans just left him there for seven years, and in all that time, nobody died. Finally, St. Peter said to the Lord, Lord, this has gone on for long enough. We'll have to do something about it. The Lord agreed, and when he told Hans to let Death down from the tree... The Lord agreed, and he told Hans to let Death down from the tree. Hans had to do that, of course, and Death went up to him at once and strangled him. So off they went into the other world. When they got there, Hans went straight up to the gate of heaven and knocked. Who's there? said St. Peter. It's me, Gambling Hans. Well, go on, clear off, you needn't think about coming in here. Next he went to the gate of purgatory and knocked there. Who is it? Gambling Hans. Go away, we've got enough misery here. We don't want gambling as well to make it worse. So Hans had nowhere to go but hell. And when he knocked on the gate there, they let him in at once. There was no one at home but the devil himself and all the ugly devils, because the handsome devils had gone to earth on business. The second Hans got there, he sat down to play. The devil had nothing to t stake but his ugly devils, and soon they all belonged to Hans, because he was playing with the cards that couldn't lose. Once he'd won the ugly devils, he took them all off to Hohenfurt, where they grow hops. They, they pulled out all the hop poles and climbed up to heaven, and then they began to lever up the walls. The stonework was beginning to give way, so St. Peter said, Lord, we'll have to let him in. We haven't got a choice. So they let him in. But as soon as he was inside, Hans set about gambling again, and very soon there was such a noise of shouting and arguing among the citizens that the angels couldn't hear themselves think. St. Peter went to Lord once more. Lord, I've had enough, he said. We've got to chuck him out. He's driving everyone mad. So they got hold of him and hurled him out of the gate and all the way down to earth. His soul was smashed to pieces, and the little splinters went everywhere. In fact, there's one of them in the soul of every gambler who's alive today. Well, <laughs> that was wild. And I think that's going to be where we end it tonight. But boy, I had a lot of fun. And I'm very happy that you were here. Freeman, Cinder, and Quill. And anyone else who might be here who hasn't said hello, hello. And thank you for being here. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up real quick, actually. And hope that you each have a wonderful rest of the evening. Get some rest, drink some water. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.